welcome. Uh, what a public spirited uh, audience we have here today showing up uh, to listen uh, to people talking about pandemics right before dinner. Uh, we, have, we appreciate you all coming. I want to inter uh, introduce, I'm Ross Anderson. I'm a senior editor at The Atlantic. And with me, I've got Ron Klain, who is the director of Ebola Response in the Obama White House, and Nancy Sullivan, who's a senior investigator um, uh, basically on pandemics uh, at NIH. And we are going to talk about pandemics. Um, to start with, uh, this has been kind of counterintuitive for me. Um, I have this kind of lazy assumption that in matters of science and in biomedicine in particular, that we're sort of always steadily advancing and that like the, um, uh, the threats that we face from nature are constantly receding in the face of our technological prowess. And yet, everything I read about pandemics suggests that they're actually happening at a quicker clip now and that we're actually, they're becoming more dangerous. And I was hoping you guys could tell me why. Well, um, <clears throat> so thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, they seem to be happening with increasing frequency, and it may have something to do with the increasing frequency with which humans are interacting with nature and pushing into areas where these viruses are harbored in other animal species. And so what we have is what's called a zoonotic crossover. So more than 70% of these viruses that occur in humans come from animals. And so as we move into where they live, I think that the risk of exposure gets higher. And we've seen that now over the last years with MERS and SARS and Ebola and Zika, uh, chikungunya, West Nile, many of these that are transmitted from either mosquitoes or other vertebrate vectors. Yeah, and, and they're also uh, political policy and developmental factors. So uh, we live in a much more globalized planet. People get on planes and fly over the, all over the world, a disease that's in some remote part of China. Someone can get on a train, go to Beijing, get on a plane, be here in a matter of hours. That wasn't true 100 years ago, of course. And the great success of economic development in the developing world has connected major cities to rural areas. Ebola was a disease that until 2014 really had existed in very, very remote areas. That's where this epidemic began. But now, because there are roads and ways to travel from those remote areas to big cities, it came into the major cities in West Africa. And then we also have to talk about other changes. Climate change is a factor here also. Uh, climate change is uh, stressing different uh, human populations, animal populations, forcing them to interact in new ways uh, and accelerating also the flow of people, refugees, uh, struggles for resources, all these things uh, spread these disease. So you know, humans get better than nature, but humans also do a lot of things to change the planet. That also stirs the pot quite a bit. Nancy, I want to go back to something you said uh, about uh, habitat encroachment, so humans moving into places that were previously wildernesses. What are the kinds of wildernesses that are sort of particularly uh, hotbeds for producing mm -hmm. new pathogens? Mm -hmm. So for Ebola, um, <laughs> you know, it used to be that the only place you would find Ebola was in the, in the jungle in mm -hmm. Africa. And as we know from the West African outbreak, all you need is one person to get close to where that reservoir is. We call where it's existing in, in nature, we call that a reservoir. And the reservoir might be in a bat, it might be a monkey, it might be a mosquito, um, but it takes just that initial contact. So it's difficult to say where the hotbeds are, but generally they're in places where you have these animal species existing um, and the viruses can coexist with them. Okay. And, uh, Tell me about Ebola. Um, I, it's funny listening, uh, maybe it was because I read uh, The uh, Hot Zone by Richard Preston when I was a kid. I remember tearing through it. And then when I first got into science writing, I remember like reading a lot of tis tisking about that book and some of the, the fantasies in it. But having been trained on that material, uh, when I found out that I think it was 11,000 people died in the last mm -hmm. Ebola outbreak, um, I regarded that maybe as a success, as like a situation that was brought under control relatively quickly. But the perception that I'm reading was that it was actually a failure. Why yeah. is that? Well, so it's both. So obviously anything where 11,000 <laughs> people wind up dead is sure. obviously a tragedy and a, and a failure. And so, since the largest death toll from any out, Ebola outbreak before that had been like 75, it certainly dwarfed uh, anything we'd seen like that before. It's a success 
in the sense that it, in October, September and October of 2014, when this really got the world's attention, the uh, most prominent models suggested as many as a million people might die. And that was really focused only on two, uh, three West African countries, didn't build in the possibility that if we hadn't gotten the disease under control, it surely would have spread to Nigeria, a uh, highly populous country, and other parts of Africa, and who knows from there. So, so a million was kind of a, a bit of a conservative estimate, if you, if you will. And so against a backdrop of a million potential deaths, obviously 11,000 uh, is a success, right? And so um, it was far and away the worst Ebola outbreak we've ever seen, but uh, because of uh, you know, people in West Africa themselves taking the lead in fighting the disease, supported by a, a global response in which the United States played an absolutely critical role, um, we were able to bend the curve faster than it might have bent, get uh, relief in place, uh, bring the disease under control, and prevent it from becoming the kind of catastrophe that it could easily have become uh, when we first started to really focus on this in the fall of 2014. Nancy, I want to ask you, uh, given that you study the viruses themselves and are something of a connoisseur, I wonder if they like, I, I separately wonder if there's a kind of Stockholm syndrome. Like, do you come to admire them uh, at all? But more to the point, I wonder, uh, Ebola growing up again uh, was sort of like the real boogeyman, if you will, of the pathogen world. Um, is it still, what, what, what are the, the potential pathogens, or even fantasy is the wrong word, but hypothetical pathogens that scare you most? So to answer your first question, um, yes, there is a, a fascination with viruses, and I think that's what drives most scientists, is a curiosity about how things work. And my curiosity is, why didn't we have a vaccine that could protect against Ebola virus? What was it about this virus that was thwarting the human immune system. And so the study of that interaction is really what was driving me for all of those years to develop a vaccine. Um, you know, in terms of what scares me the most, I think there are a lot of viruses out there and there is always the potential uh, for a virus to become um, pathogenic in humans even if it's not in its reservoir where it lives. So for Ebola, it's living somewhere in a reservoir, and we don't have thousands or hundreds of thousands of animals dying from Ebola that we know of. It was that crossover event into humans that in humans did not have the immunity to control the virus. And so theoretically, that could happen with any virus. Um, and so I think we have to work very, very hard to understand how these viruses work and how we respond to those viruses immunologically when we're exposed. And that's where vaccines come in because it gives you those tools, your body, those tools before you're exposed. Um, are there, I, I often read about things like um, search engine tricks where people are, that like somebody, some public health organization is monitoring search engines so that people are, if they're searching, if you see a cluster of people yeah. searching for a specific set of symptoms, that flags it, like maybe there's some weird flu strain there. Um, I wonder what else is going on, like both in nature, like what, how are people, are people monitoring gorillas in some way or like, uh, or even just out in the rural parts of the world yeah. of which there are many? Yeah, uh, you know, um, I'm an external advisor to the Skoll Global Threats Fund and mm -hmm. one, th one thing they've really focused on is uh, the fastest way to track the pace of bird flu in China is to track the price of chickens in different markets, small rural markets mm -hmm. in China. And when the price of chicken drops dramatically, that means there's a bird flu outbreak. And mm -hmm. they find it out that way before it gets reported to health authorities. The price of chicken drops dramatically in small rural markets because farmers have sick chickens, they bring them to market, the price plummets. And so uh, there are things like that, different things. The, the Google searching for flu symptoms is a way a lot of public health authorities uh, follow flu in the United States. Um, but you know, in, in the end, uh, you know, we're really reliant as a planet so far right now on, you know, very traditional tools of epidemiology and public health systems and, uh, and uh, you know, reporting of these things and then reporting from local, re local governments to national governments up to the World Health Organization. And that's really our basic security as a, as a planet right now. And Nancy, do you see any of that at like the interface between nature and civilization? Yeah. yeah. So, um, 
It's really important to have those tools, and it's important to have an array of different approaches to looking at these things because the globe is vast, right? When we think about all of the places that we would have to look to find these things, it's, it's pretty overwhelming. But we employ different technologies to do that. So whether it's modeling in a computer or looking at markets, we even look in the feces of apes for antibodies against Ebola to see if Ebola might be residing in a particular area. So all of these different approaches are very important. Yeah. Um, let's talk about what's not working, like how our public health response is flawed. Um, one of the things I was surprised to learn, uh, Ron, from uh, a wonderful little piece you did actually for the Aspen Institute site uh, that I think was published this morning or yep. yesterday, um, was that I just assume, again, like I have this faith in civilization that like these common sense things are happening, but apparently they're not happening, that uh, we're still reliant on national militaries to move in when there's, if, if something happens in Liberia, for instance. Yeah. Um, instead of there's not like a global white helmet sort of right. neutral force that won't be seen like, you know, Marines coming in. Um, why is that? How, how is it that no one has done that yet? Yeah, so, you know, I, I used to say during the Ebola response, people were afraid that people in black helicopters would show up and take over places. And the thing people needed to be afraid of was that there were no people in black helicopters to come and help <laughs> us out. And, and the fact of the matter is, as a planet, we really aren't prepared for... Um, a, a major epidemic event, a, a, a pandemic of the scale of like the Spanish flu of 1918. We're not prepared for that at all. And we're very reliant on each country to take care of diseases that break out inside their own borders. And the World Health Organization fundamentally is a, an information sharing organization, not a response organization. There is no World Health Organization plane or helicopter or boat of people waiting to parachute in to stop some epidemic. They basically get reports and share them and implement the World Health Regulations, International Health Regulations. And so uh, we saw during the Ebola outbreak that uh, one problem that was uh, really dangerous in West Africa was, as the epidemic got worse and worse, uh, the, the heroic, the amazing NGOs, particularly Partners in Health and MSF, that were in there treating people were afraid about security. Was it be safe for their people to go and to, and to work in the region? Could they get out? All these things. And so, and, and they said, well, wh where's the security? Where are the people to help get us in and out of the region? Where are the people to help us with logistics? President Obama made an unprecedented decision. For the first time in American history, he agreed to deploy U.S. troops to help support an epidemic response. Never sent our troops overseas to do something like that. It was the first time ever. And we were very fortunate in the sense that all three of the West African countries have great relations with the West. We sent U.S. troops into Liberia, which we have a long-standing relationship with. The British uh, sent troops into Sierra Leone, the French into Guinea. And that was a critical element of building the infrastructure and the backbone for the response. But there are large parts of the world where American troops would not be welcome as responders, would not be greeted as heroes or French troops or British troops. And so one idea that came out of the Ebola epidemic was an idea from the EU to create a, a kind of a white helmet battalion, an international group of responders who could provide a lot of the basic support stuff that we use troops to do in West Africa on an internationalized basis without some country's flag on their shoulders, uh, kind of like a, a UN kind of force. And that's something we need because we're going to have one of these outbreaks that's going to be in a place where the 101st Airborne is not going to be welcome, and there's really not going to be the core infrastructure, security structure, all the things you need to let the healthcare workers do the job of, of, of dealing with communities and, and sick people. Nancy, from your vantage point at the NIH, and I know you've done work on Ebola, um, uh, what did you feel during that outbreak? Did you like feel that same sense of kind of helplessness that the gears were moving too slow internationally? I was grateful that we had been doing the work for many, many years. Um, a vaccine did not solve the Ebola outbreak, but um, the fact that we had been applying those tools to develop vaccines and understand how to control this virus with a vaccine was very important to, to just know that it could be deployed and it would be useful if it had gotten to that point. As Ron said, um, really it was traditional public health measures in, in the case of the West African outbreak that helped and the U.S. government was really fundamental for, for um, putting that infrastructure in place. But you do need 
that investment, the institutional investment over many, many years to study these viruses and the immune responses and, and be able to respond if needed. Yeah, if I could, I mean, Nancy's extremely modest. Nancy is the person who discovered the first ever Ebola vaccine. <laughs> and I had the pleasure of meeting her when we brought President, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I had the pleasure of meeting her. We brought President Obama to her lab at NIH to get a briefing from Nancy and to see uh, where she had worked and where she had done this pioneering work. And so, you know, Nancy is one of those 20-year overnight success stories, um, <laughs> which is that, you know, we we're very fortunate to be able to take her vaccine and get it into clinical trials as the Ebola epidemic was uh, going on. That was possible because Nancy had spent the previous 20 years working on this project. And uh, you know, very selflessly, and, and over a long career, doing fantastic work that made this possible. And I think, you know, it's a it's a classic case of why we need to invest in basic science and basic research, because no one could have known when Nancy started on this journey 20 years ago that 20 years later, in the fall of 2014, the world would need an Ebola vaccine. Right? There's no computer model or forecast that would tell that. But having scientists like Nancy in the lab doing that kind of work and funding that is a critical part of us being prepared for whatever comes next or next or next after that. And so, uh, you know, I think her career and her success is, a, is a, just an amazing case study for why we need to be investing in the kind of scientific research that can create the kind of breakthroughs that Nancy produced in 2014. Well, you know, the, the funny story there is that when we published the first paper, I think it was in 2000, showing, like, well, I, I thought it was fabulous that we showed for the first time that you could protect monkeys against Ebola. And there were a couple of stories written um, saying, eh, I don't know, is that really, why is it such a big deal and published in this magazine? And, and so you don't really know what you need to know until you're faced with a crisis like we were in 2014. Nancy, having seen 20 years of that research landscape, uh, what strikes you as the biggest difference across two decades? Um, are there more people working in your field? Is the work um, just noticeably more sophisticated? So there have been many advances, um, mostly since I started, but you know, I'm sure you all know the story about smallpox vaccines and how you, they would use lesions and make a, a dust and squirt it in the nose of people. And of course, that practice stopped when they started killing people because yeah. they were dying from the vaccine. And then in the 1950s, when um, Watson and Crick discovered the structure of DNA, uh, we began to learn a little bit more, and that really through the 70s and 90s with um, recombinant DNA technology, it enabled us to make vaccines from proteins, pieces of viruses, instead of giving someone the whole virus that could kill them. Now we could take little pieces that, that would, people could make an immune response against. And then even later in the 90s with polymerase chain reaction, it's a way to synthesize DNA. We can take the sequence of a newly discovered virus now and theoretically have a vaccine in a phase one trial in a matter of months. It's not 20 years, it's not 30 years or 40 years, but because we can synthesize that piece of DNA. But again, that goes back to a discovery in 1950 that was chemistry. It was basically understanding <laughs> the chemistry of deoxyribonucleosides and you would have all fallen asleep if someone sat down and tried to tell you how exciting that was. But it turns out even for the Ebola vaccine, being able to do that was critical. The Zika vaccine, within just a couple of months, um, the, the DNA was synthesized, put into people, and a phase one trial. So uh, with that in mind, to return to the pessimistic note that we began on, um, <laughs> well, why should we be more afraid than ever of a looming pandemic? Yeah, so unfortunately, viruses are very sophisticated even though they're very small. And what works for one virus will not work for another. So even in the case of Ebola, the vaccine that works against its cousin, Marburg, doesn't work against Ebola. And so these viruses are, even though they only have a few genes, we've got 20,000 or more functional genes, right? You would think that we can conquer any virus that comes along. But because they've co-evolved in humans, 
they know how to circumvent whatever we throw at them in an immune response. And that means for each virus, we have to figure out the Achilles heel of that virus. So what part of our immune system is going to be able to get rid of that virus? And that is a long process. That's what it was with Ebola. And there are failures. But the good thing is most times you learn something really important from the failures. And it's a process that I think it makes me less afraid because I know we have new technologies to do something. But it, I'm still afraid because all of these viruses are so different. And, and you know the saying, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Well, think about viruses. You know, we're throwing stuff at them to get rid of them. And then they're figuring out ways to get around that. Well, and, uh, you know, then there are the, the human and um, policy factors. So uh, people, tra as I said before, people travel, they travel faster than ever and more than ever. So in 2009, we had an H1N1 epidemic, a uh, worldwide epidemic. By the time we realized we had this in the United States, there were tens of millions of people who already had H1N1 in the United States before we realized we had an H1N1 problem. Uh, there's time lags in producing these vaccines. Nancy and her colleagues discover these amazing vaccines. They obviously have to be tested. Even once tested, it takes a long time to actually make them. So again, on H1N1, we, had, we developed a vaccine. By the time we got it made, the epidemic was over in the United States, okay? 60, 70 million Americans had H1N1. The only reason this is not one of the great, sad, historic events in American history was the flu wasn't that lethal. Had it been, the vaccine would not have arrived in time. And then there are policy problems and legal problems, coordination problems. So the vaccine didn't get done in time for the United States. It did get done in time for the epidemic when H1N1 got to Europe in 2010. But because there was no legal structure for administering the vaccine, no rules about who would be liable if the vaccine made people sick, no way to get the vaccine approved on an international basis, it sat in warehouses in Europe while people got H1N1 because no one could agree who to give it, how to give it, where to give it. And a lot of those legal issues and policy issues still remain today. We have an amazing uh, new project uh, backed uh, by the Gates Foundation, by the Wellcome Trust in England, by a lot of other international donors called CEPI that's trying to really produce the vaccines we will need to deal with the pandemic that is coming. But unless we have agree international agreements about how those vaccines get approved, who's liable if they make people sick, who's going to pay for that, how you're going to deal with the intellectual property issues around those vaccines, we're not going to be able to administer them. And we just saw an example of this. We had an Ebola outbreak the past few months in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It, in the end, was stopped by traditional public health measures. But it would have been incredibly prudent to vaccinate healthcare workers in the DRC to prevent them from getting <coughs> sick while fighting this. And we couldn't vaccinate them because there's no agreement between the vaccine makers, the WHO, <laughs> and the government of the Democratic Republic of Congo about how to administer the vaccines who'd owned the various intellectual property elements, all these things. So as we need to do much better to plan it on all these kinds of policy and response issues than we've done. And that's why uh, we need to be scared about this. Ron, I want to ask you uh, in particular about policy responses. Uh, what does that look like from the, uh, from the inside? So like, were you sitting in your office one day, this outbreak is unfolding, and President Obama just walks in and is like, hey, go get Ebola. Or like, how does it how does it work, and what did what did it look like to staff up, and how yeah. quickly could you deploy? So I was uh, sitting in my office. I worked for Revolution, a venture capital firm uh, led by Steve Case in the second row there, and I was literally sitting at my desk one day in October, in the middle of this outbreak, when the phone rang. And it was President Obama, and he said, uh, "You know, why don't you come back into the administration and take over this Ebola response?" And I said, "Well, uh, you know, uh, well, one, you know, I'm not a doctor, right?" And he said, "Yeah, yeah, I do, I do." I said, well, you know that you're going to be really badly criticized for picking someone who's not a doctor to do this, and I'm going to be really badly criticized for coming to do it. And he said, well, there's two scenarios here, Ron. One is uh, I, I think you'll do a great job, and I think this will work, and then all the noise around your being picked won't matter, or you won't do a great job, it won't work, <laughs> and the noise around you being picked is the least of our problems. <laughs> and, um, Cold you know, comfort. And, and the truth is that... Um, the, the truth is that I think what the president had in mind was we had all the best doctors in the world working on the Ebola response. There was no shortage of medical expertise. We had uh, fantastic leaders in our public health agencies at NIH, Nancy's boss, Tony Fauci, and Tom Frieden at CDC, and Nikki Lurie at, at Asper at HHS. Great people involved. 
but we never faced a crisis like this as a country. There were a lot of policy issues that needed to be resolved and a lot of coordination issues. The president had ordered 17 federal agencies to work on the Ebola response. As I mentioned before, we were deploying troops for the first time ever. We had the issue of Ebola coming into the United States, how you monitor people coming to this country from West Africa, all these issues. And so he asked me to come in and try to coordinate that and put all those pieces together and make sure we could be as effective as possible. And, you know, uh, my view on this is, and I've, I've written about this, um, you know, there should never be someone like me ever again. Mm -hmm. Um, we should have a permanent coordinating capacity inside the White House, a directorate in the National Security Council. Inside the National mm -hmm. Security Council, there are people who full-time work on climate change, who full-time work on terrorism, bioterrorism, all these things. We should have a full-time group working on pandemic response and preparedness, a deputy assistant to the president whose job it is to do this every single day. And so you don't need to call in someone from the outside to quarterback a response like this. And, uh, you know, that's the kind of ongoing effort we really need to, to be prepared as a country and as a world for the kinds of things that are going to come. So and while I, you, I'm sorry, go I'll ahead. I'll tell you see. that the, the doctors, the research doctors, the medical doctors said, Phew, thank God they didn't <laughs> pick a doctor and they picked Ron Klain because he did a great job. Thank you. Um, yeah. There's a lot of love between these two. <laughs> um, uh, so Tell me, and this uh, veers into a more sensitive subject, but during that Ebola outbreak, uh, famously, uh, our current president tweeted, uh, I don't know if it was one, but several alarmist uh, tweets about Ebola and, and really kind of inflamed people saying, oh, shut down the borders and this, this sort of thing. Um, does that worry you uh, now, having him at the, the helm of the executive branch were something like this to happen again? Well, it doesn't make me feel great. Uh, <laughs> look, what I will say is that what President Trump, then Citizen Trump, tweeted in the fall of 2014 was irresponsible and inhumane, uh, including tweets that suggested that Dr. Kent Brantley, who was an evangelical doctor who had been sent to West Africa by Samaritan's Purse, led by Franklin Graham, that he should be left to die in West Africa because it was too dangerous to bring him home to treat him here. And we brought we brought Kent Brantley home. We treated him. I've met him several times. He's a wonderful man, and I'm, I'm very glad that you know, Donald Trump didn't make that decision. Now, having said that, what I will say is last week here at Spotlight Health, uh, uh, Secretary Tom Price was here, uh, uh, and he said uh, straight up he thought what uh, Donald Trump had tweeted in 2014 was wrong, and that it wasn't the policy of the Trump administration, and that, uh, and that Secretary Price was uh, actually kind of praiseworthy of the Ebola response we had done in 2014. And that was my experience back then, actually. We obviously had critics and people saying things. But I, I will say one thing that doesn't story doesn't get told enough is we had an amazing bipartisan response to the Ebola epidemic. President uh, Obama sent a funding request to Congress the day after Election Day 2014. Five weeks later, Congress approved 90% of it without any strings or conditions. And that really was the, the fuel that made this turnaround that you talked about at the beginning, Ross. Now look, as we stand here today, what, on the political side, what makes me nervous the most isn't so much President Trump per se, but a feeling, a, a, a spirit of kind of xenophobia in the country that is really the risk. And you really saw this play out last year with Zika. Why was it that when our public health officials were telling people that the importation of Zika was likely, that we'd have domestic transmission. Why wasn't it ultimately got to the point where, for the first time in American history, the Centers for Disease Control had to issue a travel advisory for travel to parts of the United States of America because we had domestic transmission of Zika. Why didn't Congress respond? And I'll tell you why. The reason was there were a lot of people who said, hey, this is a disease brought to the country by immigrants. Why don't we just keep the immigrants out? You know, why should we invest money in health care when we can just you know, do better at keeping out immigrants. And the last thing I'll say on this is, you know, there is no wall we can build, physical or metaphorical, that can protect the people of the United States from epidemics. What we can do is engage in the world to back the idea of global health security, to help build national health care systems around the world, to build up our global response capacity, to fight these diseases overseas and to help uh, countries develop their own capacities to test, isolate, and respond to epidemics. By engaging in the world, we obviously do something that's very humanitarian, 
but ultimately, we actually do the best we can to protect the American people from these diseases coming over here. And thinking that we can just keep them out with a wall is a very misguided approach. I wonder, yeah. um, I think uh, uh, the president's sort of uh, uh, tendency to riff notwithstanding, there are a lot of people who do have it's just intuitive that you think, oh wow, if they find some, if something like Ebola, if it were airborne, God forbid, um, in the United States of America, in some small town, a lot of people would agree with the impulse to go in and heavily quarantine. Um, and yet, uh, the more you read, it seems like quarantine is actually not the answer. Why is that? What's well, you know, I think that um, he, he, here's here's the challenge. First of all. We're the richest country in the world, and even we aren't prepared. So at the out, beginning of the Ebola outbreak, we had a grand total of six hospital beds in the United States of America that could treat a patient with a deadly, dangerous, and infectious disease. Okay? Now, through a lot of hard work uh, over the course of the Ebola epidemic, we got that up to about 100 beds in America. Okay? The largest city, the largest country of those beds is in New York City, where I think we had up to 14. Okay. So it would not have taken much of an outbreak in New York City to use up all 14 of those beds, right? I mean, and, and that was the peak. In, in Washington, see, we had four. Uh, in Los Angeles, I think we had two. So, you know, we haven't built the capacity to deal with this. The problem with quarantines, even domestically, is... Who would actually quarantine these people? Where are the public health cops to show up and do that? And how would you feed them and get them basic necessities of life? And how would you actually keep them from leaving and all these things, right? And so, you know, uh, we don't have really, what we really need is a better investment on the response side in having a kind of capacity to do that. So for example, uh, if there were a tornado or earthquake or a hurricane uh, in a community, the president could send in help overnight. There's something called the Stafford Act that gives the president the authority without Congress's approval to send in assistance to help a local community deal with something like that. The Stafford Act doesn't allow the president to do that for epidemics. So if nature strikes by a tornado, the president can send help. If nature strikes by a virus, that Nancy studied, the president can't send help. He has to wait for Congress to pass a bill to approve a response, okay? That's crazy, right? That's mm -hmm. craziness, right? On a permanent basis, we ought to have a public health emergency fund, some kind of fund that, again, the president could tap immediately to send a response to. We don't have a public health emergency fund in the United States. Uh, there's actually, bi again, this is an area of bipartisan support. Uh, Senator Cassidy, Republican from Louisiana, Senator Brian Schatz from Hawaii have come together on a bipartisan plan to do this. So there is a bipartisan way to get this done. We need to do something like that, right? We need to also then get our first responders better trained to deal with that. I mean, even in the biggest city in the world, New York, our first responders <coughs> didn't really know what to do. When Craig Spencer, a doctor, showed up with Ebola, well, what were they supposed to do with them? So we need to train our first responders. We need to give the president more authority. We need to create more money so we really could have the right kind of response in the event of an outbreak. Um, I want to take some questions from the audience, but before I do, uh, I want to ask both of you, um, on this subject where uh, the public being informed is just so important, how does the pop culture that we see around pandemics um, whether it's the books I was talking about earlier, films like Contagion, or even zombie uh, entertainments, which have become quite popular over the last 10 years. Uh, are those a net negative or a net positive when it comes to educating people about the kind of risks? Uh, Ron Good. will talk about specific movies that he knows very well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but there, there is a, a place for that. But I think science education is equally important because um, I think most people don't understand what that process is that you have to go through to develop vaccines and therapies and really what the risks are and weighing the risks of a virus versus driving on the beltway around Washington, D.C. and responding appropriately to those different risks. 
Um, I, I think that science education really is one area that I'd like to see play out a little bit more um, in helping people understand what the movies mean and what's real and what's not. Yeah, I mean, I think two things. One, uh, on the one hand, the way in which we communicate uh, can be a great tool to get out information. And, um, you know, during the Ebola response, we used Twitter and all kinds of means to get out information to people. And, and, and in fact, one of the challenges we had in West Africa was the lack of these communication uh, uh, elements. We, we actually had to build radio stations in Guinea and Liberia to send out public service announcements because people couldn't hear public service announcements because they didn't have radio coverage. So, you know, these technologies really help get out information. That's a good thing. And I will also say the technologies are being used in new ways to track these things. One, we were using Twitter during the Ebola outbreak to track reports of different kinds of things and so get real-time information. That's all great. On the other hand, there's no question that our cable news culture where everything has to be a debate makes it more complicated for public health professionals to communicate reliable scientific information to people and not that turn into some debate. We saw this during the Ebola epidemic where people would go on to, so we'd, you'd have the leading experts say, uh, by the way, after 21 days, there's very little risk of transmission. And they'd find some person to go on and say, well, I disagree with that. And then you had some debate about that. And then, you know, and so, so a lot of misinformation comes out through, through the media. So we, we, we have to do that. You know, um, last thing I'll say, I don't want to filibuster, but, uh, but, but um, during the Ebola epidemic, people would say, I don't understand why the people, what, people are getting Ebola because of these burial rituals in West Africa, because of how people cl cleanse the bodies before they buried them. And people would say, time, I don't understand why you don't just explain the science to these people over there, and why don't they just stop doing that? And literally in the middle of this, in December, we had a measles outbreak in California because people in our country don't vaccinate their children because they don't believe the science around that, okay? So I go back to what Nancy said. We need science education. We need people to believe honest scientific information because we can't go around and tell the rest of the world they need to believe in science if our own people don't believe in science. And we need to do a better job of educating our people to believe in science because uh, that's another critical element to keeping us all safe. All right. Questions from the audience? Right here. Oh, we've got a microphone coming for you. I understand why public health, uh, the world, public health in the United States can't get around to other countries. But we do have the World Health Organization that should be able to get to all the countries. We do have the United Nations, which could have be a central, because they do it in wartime. They could certainly do it to fight a, a pandemic in another country. So what isn't being done that makes these great organizations that are already in place not be working toward solving this problem? <laughs> Can I, can I still have the mic? Okay. Yeah. Number two is public service information announcements that are on cable stations with the same repetition that those clinics do, that the prescription drug companies do. Come on, guys. Get it out there because a lot of people aren't bypassing the commercials. A lot of them are listening. And you repeat it seven to ten times, they've heard it. Thank you. Thank you. Good idea. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think the, the global response problem, it, it is, it is I, I agree with you, it, it is the most vexing thing to me. What I'll tell you is the WHO was built as an organization to kind of, ha built on the premise that each country could take care of itself if it shared information and broadcast alerts. It, 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 there are no... That there's no department of response at the WHO. It's just not how it's built. Now, they just elected a new director general. He has said he's going to take this on. Um, you know, may maybe they will. Let let's hope so. The UN definitely uh, launched a special response to Ebola. Um, wasn't really that effective or well organized. You know, I think one lesson I learned in the Ebola response from, uh, from Tom Frieden, the fantastic 
former head of the CDC, was that the way you fight these epidemics is by having existing capacity that you flex up, not trying to build from scratch in the middle of the crisis. And I think as we look at all these global institutions, we need to just build in more capacity that can be dialed up. I mean, you're not going to permanently have hundreds of people sitting around, but, you know, that can be dialed up. And, and, and that's not, we aren't even a square one on that in a lot of these institutions. Yeah, that surge capacity is really important. So during the Ebola outbreak, um, you know, I have a small research lab, and I train postdocs from around the world who th they're supposed to come and learn over a period of three to five years. The entire lab was dedicated to that Ebola response over the Christmas holidays. Everyone stayed, no one went home, and because there wasn't that surge capacity that's really, really important. Um, I just want to comment on your idea about public service announcements because I think it's really, really important. And in the Democratic Republic of Congo, they have been highly successful controlling their Ebola outbreaks. There's a, um, a doctor named Mayembe, uh, JJ Mayembe, who has spent um, his career since the 1976 outbreak educating uh, villagers in Congo uh, just what hygiene steps can be taken, what you need to avoid in the burial process. And really, that is highly, highly effective. Um, it's not to say that we don't need vaccines and treatments, but that's the first step in trying to control an outbreak is getting the information out to people in a reliable way. Right here. Thank you. It's a great presentation. It's extremely interesting. Um, uh, first, is tell us about the Spanish flu. Uh, what made that different? And uh, because it killed millions of people around the world, and what what has happened since that has uh, caused that not to be repeated? And and then maybe re a little bit related to that, the progress and and challenges relating to developing antibiotic resistant bacteria progress that we are not making in that field, but first the Spanish flu is my question. So viral pathogenesis has many components. Um, part of it is the virus, and part of it is how we respond to the virus. And how we respond um, depends on our previous exposures. And there still are many countervailing theories for what made the 1918 flu so deadly, and it's a combination of those things. I think your question <laughs> is really, can that happen again, and what do we do about that? And um, we were actually talking a little bit before the panel, but wouldn't it be nice if we could predict what's going to be problematic? And unfortunately, we can't. What we can do is be prepared the best we can, and so whether that's policy or science. So as I mentioned, for, for Zika, we had the experience of West Nile. We, we don't have those families of viruses that are entirely predictable, but the more we know about different viruses and the different kinds of vaccine responses we need to protect against them, the better able we'll be to respond to the next thing and not let it be something that kills 50 million people. And I'm sorry, I forgot your second question. Ah, so um, I'm sorry. I don't know that field very well. Um, I think that what we do know is that, that bacteria and viruses can evolve to escape what we throw at them. And so what we see with antibiotic resistance, of course, is if there's overuse of antibiotics, we're developing more and more resistant strains. So it's an area of study that's very, very important. So uh, multidrug resistant TB. Um, lots of examples where we, we are in sort of a, a, a critical situation now where the, the drugs that we have available to, to treat these, these different bacteria are, are dwindling in numbers. And so it's really important to, again, do that basic research that's needed to maybe, maybe we take a new approach. Maybe it's not a typical antibiotic. Maybe we have another way, another kind of therapeutic that would, would do the same thing but not give us that same level of res resistance. Right back there. <clears throat> Thank
thanks. And thanks to the panel and to Ron and Nancy, thanks for everything you had done and continue to do. Um, you talked about what's being done um, on the development of new vaccines. Um, and you also talked about the policies that need to be created to ensure that the, um, that the systems, the technical systems are in place to get the vaccines to the ground. But can you talk about what systems or mechanisms we have into place that when we have a licensed vaccine for these epidemics and they're available, how do they get to the ground? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. So, uh, you know, we have, first of all, the question is how do you first make them? So one thing that we have now is we have an agency, BARDA, that uh, in part of Health and Human Services, that does contracts to create vaccine manufacturing capacity and to uh, storehouse vaccines, but also have capacity to make vaccines. And that's one critical thing. Obviously, you can't get them distributed if you don't have them. And so increasing our manufacturing capacity and doing some scientific pioneering work to make it easier to make these vaccines, these are all critical things. How you distribute them, though, is not science, but politics and policy. And we really struggled with this in the Obama White House during H1N when we, when, when we thought the vaccine would be ready. Who would get it first? How would you decide who got it, right? And there are scientific guidance about different risk groups and so on and so forth. But different parts of the country, distribution mechanisms, so on and so forth. Big challenges which we don't have answers to yet, we need answers to. And then there are the less obvious and complicated issues. Like in West Africa, as Nancy's vaccine and other vaccine candidates became available, we launched clinical trials to try them on people. But we had, a, frankly, a dispute with the West African government about who owned the intellectual property from those clinical trials. Did the vaccine makers own them? Did the agency sponsoring own them? Or did the West African governments themselves own them? And, uh, and, and so all these things, all these questions can get in the way of actually giving people shots. I mean, that is, in the end, what you want to see is people lined up getting those vaccines. And, um, and, and you know, the last thing I'll say about this, on the, in the global context, there's really no structure to resolve that. There's no international organization that really settles this. And, um, and the liability issues are big issues. I'm no shill for the big pharma companies in any way, shape, or form, but I will say I understand their perspective that in a crisis, if they develop a va if they bring to market a vaccine very, very quickly, they need to know who's going to be responsible, who's going to pay if, if people get sick because of the vaccine or people make claims of that. And so having some structure. In the United States, we have a mechanism. We have something called the PrEP Act. It was passed in the 1970s. Uh, after the swine flu epidemic that says that in the event of an emergency, the Secretary of Health and Human Services can activate a statute which basically says that if you get this vaccine for some emergency thing and you get sick, there's an administrative compensation fund that pays you for how you get sick from the vaccine. And indeed, during the Ebola response, Secretary Burwell activated the PrEP Act and any Americans, which were largely am Americans in embassies who we might have given the vaccine to, would have had relief. There's no global PrEP Act. In fact, there are ha only a handful of countries that have it. Even the United Kingdom doesn't have something like that. So that's the kind of stuff we need. Right here. Hi. Thanks very much. Thank you all very much. And I think actually it's really helpful to have a journalist interviewing people with scientific and scientific policy background. And I just urge the Atlantic to be a part of the better education of American public. There are people who really do want to understand. You're looking at many of them. So many thanks to you. Just a couple of positive things to mention about, first, to make the point that epidemics and pandemics are not exactly the same. That actually was a big problem with Ebola. And in some ways, the confusion may have been helpful. The fact that Americans were so frightened of a virus that was actually unlikely to be transmitted within the US, I think motivated a lot of the response. and. Be that as it may, it turned out to be a very fine thing. The second one to say is that in a country that regulates healthcare state by state rather than federally, it is important to know that some states have taken lots of initiatives in this area. There are both disaster preparedness and pandemic preparedness programs in many states in the US, including some of the reserves that you alluded to that would be smart. For flu, for example, there were drugs that are helpful against influenza that were stockpiled and made available. 
There are even respirators that have been put aside and made available for respiratory uh, epidemics. So state by state may be a new way to think about that in the US. It doesn't address the international one. That's why I wanted to mention some positive examples. So the World Health Organization was very concerned about the eradication of smallpox. You actually alluded to one of the problems very early with smallpox, but even much <laughs> later, continuing to vaccinate people for smallpox made some people really, really ill. The prospect of eliminating a disease means the prospect of even eliminating all vaccine and its attendant cost. So the World Health Organization, with lots of help from our Centers for Disease Control, actually eradicated that disease. So that's really good news. That was international cooperation mm -hmm. by something that was very feared. I think that's an important point to make, something that wasn't episodic, but rather continuous where it occurred. So there's a great deal of fright and a great deal of response. The other one is polio, which is very contemporary and really worth talking about. The World Health Organization again led an effort, this goes back now almost 25 or 30 years, and it was failing, but non-governmental organizations like Rotary and local NGOs have actually made incredible progress and we're down to only two countries and only five cases in the last year. So that looks very promising. So I think those positive examples should be motivators and we're still waiting really for world leaders to step up and come together. But your point about policy is so important. The SARS epidemic actually showed both global yeah. cooperation among scientists in an incredibly rapid recognition of an unknown disease and then internationally travel um, arrangements were so clever. And I wanted to end with that. It's not immigrants, it's not refugees. In terms of pandemics, it's the traveler. So paying attention to that could really help. Um, I, I want to get a little deeper in the room. How about back there? Thank you. I understand that uh, Aedes aegypti mosquitoes can carry at the same time Zika, chikungunya, and dengue, and can tr transmit the three viruses at the same time. Isn't it time that we, all, that, that we can screen mosquitoes and monitor mosquitoes as opposed to just uh, waiting to have confirmed cases of people, uh, con, uh, 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 people that have been uh, sick of uh, th those viruses, mm -hmm. but actually do a screening of mosquitoes as well? Yeah. I, I was, we were talking about this uh, backstage a bit, and uh, one question, as someone who's a, a big target for mosquitoes, um, <laughs> I've been, I'm, I'm often asking scientists what their ecological niche is and if it is replaceable, and as I understand it, the current research is, we could, is very cautious in the sense that we don't know yet is the first answer, but the second answer is, it looks like we get rid of them. <laughs> yeah, so uh, <laughs> y y there are sentinel um, species that I, I think it's, you know, you, you want to try to scan these different sentinel species, but I, re I remember colleagues of mine years ago looking in Africa for Ebola, and they spent countless hours in tents in the middle of Africa collecting bats, collecting mosquitoes, plants, rats, pigs. And it's a difficult task mm. when you think about how vast the globe is and really being able to scan the whole globe. But I think, again, you know, your approach is a, re it's a reasonable thought um, combined with other approaches, uh, other approaches to try to um, find out where some of these things are and can we eradicate them. The, the only caution there is, and I think Ron has a story about mosquito um, spraying, but um, you know the, the law of unintended consequences. And so when you talk about eradicating a species because you think it has some small probability of carrying a disease, I think you have to think carefully about that. Yeah, just two things. Uh, one response to that comment, then the gentleman in front. Um, I, I had a conversation with Bill Gates once about th this problem, and I said, well, 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 why don't you just, you know, he spent all this money, all these efforts fighting the disease in Africa, why don't you just go and eradicate all the mosquitoes? And he said, well, I can't afford to do that, okay? <laughs> so so the, the size and scope and scale of this project is huge, right? Mm. 
Um, so <coughs> we do need to do a better job with mosquito control there and here and all over the world, but these are very, very, very hard little critters to kill and they travel very short distances in their lives, so you have to really get the response to very pinpoint areas. There's amazing research being done on these genetically modified <laughs> mosquitoes, but whether or not they could reach all the places where all the mosquitoes are, it's like a hard, a very hard problem. You know, the one thing I'd say about the, the success stories, they are amazing success stories, and those of you who follow the TED Talks know the very first TED Prize went to Dr. Larry Brilliant, who played a key role in eradicating smallpox, and it's great stories, but I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna get into Nancy's business of science, but I will say I learned a little science while doing this. We have to distinguish between diseases that are only in humans that we could eliminate, and these zoonotic diseases, and answer we're talking for. We will never eliminate Ebola on planet Earth because there will always be animals in Africa that have Ebola that eventually will bite someone or be eaten by someone or something will happen and will spread it to humans. And so these zoonotic diseases, flu being probably the biggest one with the risk of a big global pandemic are diseases that we just can't eliminate and we need to be ready to, to deal with and respond to. And I guess, I guess what the questions that I'm hearing um, really are rightly focused on prevention. That's what we want to do. We don't want to be responding to outbreaks because it's always more costly to respond to something than to prevent it in the first place. And so there are lots of good ideas that, that you all have suggested, and I think just building on that, and so maybe we can't eradicate all the mosquitoes, but maybe we can reduce human contact with mosquitoes. And so in the case of malaria prevention, you know, uh, bed nets and, and things like that, or um, the DEET and, and different things that you can do to prevent yourself from being bitten. So there's the prevention of the exposure with clean water and, um, you know, in these poverty-stricken areas, providing them with things that allow them to avoid the exposures in the first place. And then on the science side, of course, vaccines and treatments. All right. All right, way back there. Apologies if this has come up before, but The Atlantic published in October uh, 2012 this article that talked about a, uh, a personalized bioweapon. Um, so, you know, non-state actors using these increasingly distributed technologies uh, to create terrible, terrible things. Um, how much do you worry about that? And to, to your point about prevention, what can be done other than all the other things we're trying to prevent um, uh, against natural occurring um, pandemics? Just to put a little more texture on that, the uh, article, which was before my tenure, I'll note, um, but uh, concerned uh, a designed virus that uh, was unique to the President of the United States. So mm -hmm. it was just a, a targeted virus yeah. uh, uh, based on some reading of his DNA. Yeah. So of course it's always a risk. And so BioShield, which was in 2003, um, is funding a lot of the research at NIH. To, and I'm the chief of the biodefense research section. So we do think about that. Um, again, we think about the risks um, of that happening versus natural exposure. I think the, the risks are lower, but the cost is much, much bigger, right? If someone is intentionally making something, you can imagine that the impact of that would be greater than a natural exposure. So we do prepare for that, but I, I don't stay awake at night preparing just for that. All right, we've got time for one more question right here. Thank you, I'll try to make this brief. Um, my question really relates to the psychological reaction to a health crisis from the general population. In 2003, Toronto was a North American epicenter for SARS. A colleague went to a conference like this in the US, you may have to state your name and where you live when you ask a question. When he came back to his seat, several people had moved away. Yet, in Toronto, we were all still taking subways, going to movies, gathering in loud crowds, in large crowds. Is this a symptom of it can't happen to me? Is it a lack of communication? Was it, oh, this is only really happening in the healthcare field because 40% of those infected were healthcare workers? I just, I've never really quite understood why a population did not take something like this more seriously. And I'll end my question there. Oh, that's a tough one. Yeah, look, I, 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 I don't know why people in Toronto didn't get more freaked out. I do want to go back to what the gentleman said about fear in these 
epidemics and the fear we saw in the United States in the fall of 2014 about a, a, what was a low probability event that many people in America would get Ebola, and yet there was a tremendous amount of fear. Tony Fauci um, wisely tutored me that you have to respect people's fear. I mean, he, he related back to the early days of the AIDS epidemic in the United States, where there are people who wouldn't eat in restaurants in the West Village because they were afraid that gay waiters were going to touch their plates. And, you know, and, and what Tony said was you, you have to meet people's fears, you have to educate them about their fears, and you have to give them honest and truthful information. And so when we had Craig Spencer, a uh, doctor who had been fighting Ebola in West Africa, came back to the United States, uh, wound up having Ebola, and the night before he was diagnosed, he had been in Brooklyn, he had ridden the subway, he had ridden an Uber, he had gone bowling, he had a meatball sandwich. Um, and people were like, well, what do we do about all this? Do we shut down the subways? Do we, you know, do we clean all the Ubers? Like, like what? what do we do? <laughs> and so I think you have to find the right balance between taking responsible measures to protect people and not exacerbating the fears. And what I will say about the fears is the fears do motivate people. But the saddest task I had when I was running the Ebola response in the White House was dealing with all the, how the fears impacted very innocent and courageous people. The nurses who were treating Craig Spencer at Bellevue Hospital in New York were getting evicted from their apartments because people didn't want them in there. Their children were being kicked out of school because people did not want uh, their, their kids going to school with kids who were the children of a nurse treating someone with Ebola. And we see this now much more dramatically in West Africa. People who are survivors of the disease in West Africa, people who simply treated people in West Africa, are stigmatized, they can't get work, they're isolated from their, their communities. And so one thing we need to do is, I agree, fear is a great motivator and a powerful agent, but we also have to fight stigmatization and the excesses of these fears and try to find, you know, Nancy said earlier, it's, it's, it's hard to kind of get this just right. It's hard to get people to understand risks and what's more dangerous, am I gonna get a bowl or am I gonna get hit on the 495 beltway? But, but we have to do a better job of educating people about these risks about what are legitimate fears and what aren't legitimate fears, and then how to be compassionate around the people who, who are our heroes for fighting these diseases and the victims of these diseases and make sure they aren't stigmatized afterwards and, are, uh, and we have a, the right response to that. I think that's a great note to end on. Nancy, Ron, thanks for joining us today. <laughs> <It's great. clears throat>